special guest, Wake County Elections Director, Gary Sims. My name is Siobhan Millen. I'm here with Dana Jennings, Naomi Lambert, co-founders of Politica NC, as well as with Susan Marshall, our co-moderator. They will be managing the chat room this evening. We're thrilled to see so many people with an interest in making sure we have a smoothly run election this fall. With the outbreak of COVID-19, many folks are thinking afresh about how they're gonna vote this year. The media has been filled with articles speculating about how elections will work in the midst of a pandemic. As many of you know, North Carolina has committed to maintaining all three of our traditional means of voting, election day voting, early voting and absentee voting. But many of us don't know as much about absentee voting as we do about the other forms of voting. And that's what we're here to learn about this evening. So who has been ordering their absentee ballots already? We have some information from Professor Michael Bitzer uh, that he updated last week about who has been ordering absentee. In a normal year, only four to 5% of North Carolina voters vote absentee by mail but some estimates say that at least 40% of voters may try absentee this year. So here's some information, I think that is slide four, that Professor Bitzer reported last week about what kinds of folks have been requesting absentee already. And you can see that from 2016, when we had 19,000 people at this time of the year had already voted, and as of last week, we were up to 103,000, and uh, he's gonna update his data again. You can see that uh, in 2016, it was Democrats were 38%, unaffiliated were 25%, Republicans were 37%, whereas in 2020, the requesters are, uh, Democrats are 52%, unaffiliated are 35%, and Republicans are only 13%. Um, and you can speculate on all different kinds of reasons why that might be. Okay, then we have another slide about uh, some more demographics. Um, and if you can, I'm not going to read that whole thing to you, but you can see that requesters tend to be uh, a little bit older. 45% uh, of them are over 66 years old, tend to be more female than male, and they tend to be so far, so far from the urban and suburban counties more than the rural counties. Okay, so how does absentee balloting work exactly? To help us learn about the intricacies of election procedures, who better to teach us than our Wake County Elections Director, Gary Sims. Gary Sims has worked over 21 years in elections administration in North Carolina. He started with the State Board of Elections as one of the first elections investigators in 1999. From there, Gary became the Elections Director in Wayne County. And in 2007, Wake County created the position of Deputy Elections Director, and Gary was hired to fill that role. In 2015, when the previous elections director retired, Gary became the director of elections here in Wake County. All of us who work as precinct officers, and I think there are some of you out in the audience, know that Gary runs a tight ship. Anyone who is one minute late to a training session will be refused entry and told to come back for a later session. The elections handbook is as thick as a driver's ed manual, and Gary does love a flowchart. But because of all this preparation, Wake County's elections tend to run smoothly and with reasonable wait times. So the ground rules for how we're going to operate this evening. Tonight, we'd like to provide you with an opportunity to ask Gary your questions about absentee voting. If you have a question that you'd like Gary to answer, please type your question into the chat box. I think we have some directions coming about how to do that. And we will pull from the chat and feed those questions to Gary in real time. And it would help our moderators if you would write the word question first thing in the chat so the moderators can distinguish the questions from comments, which are also welcome. If there are any questions that we do not have time to get to, Gary has agreed that he and the election staff will answer them in an FAQ section of the Wake County Board of Elections website. And please remember, Gary cannot answer political questions about particular candidates, races, or parties. We're gonna divide this subject into three areas. Number one, how do I obtain an absentee ballot? Number two, how do I fill out the return envelope correctly? Number three, what happens to my ballot after I turn it in? So we're gonna have Gary give a brief overview of each topic and then we're gonna stop for questions. So please try to keep your questions pertinent to the topic at hand. All right, all set? 
So Gary, we're going to put up that absentee request form and you can kind of walk us through that if you would. How you doing? Uh, thank you very much for having me. We, I think any opportunity we get to uh, go over uh, absentee processes, uh, the same as any of our three uh, methods, which, which voters can vote, election day, early voting, or absentee by mail. Um, so the process starts with the voter requesting the absentee ballot. Um, that can also be the near relative of the voter or legal guardian uh, for, the, for the voter. Uh, so the process is going to begin with, as of this date, the voter completing the state approved form, which is a uniform form throughout the state of North Carolina. Uh, they're going to need to provide their basic information to include their current address. Um, keep in mind the form can also be used as a update form if the voter has updated their address. So you can actually use that form for that in addition. Uh, one of the, some of the requirements are, there's certain pieces of information that's required on a form. Um, um, these are confidential information that we cannot disclose for the voter. That's the driver's license number or social security number. Also other pieces of conf confidential information is gonna be the date of birth for the voter. So um, whenever you are filling it out, please make sure, or if you're assisting other information or other individuals by giving them information, you wanna make sure to remind them that they do need to include that. Um, do keep in mind though, if a voter does leave a piece of information off of the form properly filling it out, we always look at what is the voter trying to do? Um, the voter just wants to vote. So our goal, our mission is to assist the voter and go back to the voter and try to uh, get the updated information from the voter. And sometimes that may require the actual form being uh, completed and sent back to us. Okay, um, so if, if Susan, could you go down to that middle section of the form because that has a little info about the near relative and, and Gary, you were gonna talk about who can request that for you. I see there's a section about your relationship to the voter. Right. Um, so, so typically that's going to be uh, who you really do consider to be your near, near relative. Um, those are actually defined on the actual instruction sheet uh, that accompanies the actual request form. But keep in mind that could also be the legal guardian. Uh, so on there you'll notice that we're not, um, it's not really asking uh, so much about that individual other than uh, just making sure that they understand who is responsible for that. Um, I, I, Perfect example is uh, one of my daughters, my oldest daughter, who's already graduated college. Uh, you know, I always requested for her um, to make sure that she would get her ballot. Um, and then same as my youngest daughter, um, but she's a little bit more active and she goes ahead and requests it for herself. So, um, so that's a perfect example of a near relative request uh, where a parent can do it, but also you may also have a, um, maybe a mother or a father that may need assistance or even a grandparent that may need okay. assistance. So at the bottom of that form, if Susan, you could put that up, there's one more place for that near relative, um, well, at, yes, for the near relative to sign. Uh, that's a, a, a section that some people forget. There's two signatures on here. The voter's got to sign it or well, the this, near relative. Right. Or, either or, is that right? That is correct. It's not both. Okay. Uh, so, so it's if you're requesting it for yourself, you'll sign on the left-hand side of the form. Right. And if you are the near relative requesting, you'll need to make sure that you sign it on the right-hand side of the form. So. Okay. So when? Can, so I think we've talked about who can request it. When can I order that online in this new portal that I read about? Um, we we are hearing from the state board of elections. I believe they said uh, the very last Thursday in the month of. August is their plan uh, to get that out. So um, keep in mind they do have until September 1st, um, but you know things could change, but that is the state's projected timeline for uh, doing a portal. Uh, we do not have all the information for that, but my understanding is it's supposed to be much easier for the voter to provide that information and it will also expedite getting that voter's information to us uh, so that we can assist the voter in getting their absentee ballot. Okay, so if we can take that slide down so that I don't think the guests have seen uh, Gary yet, so they they see who they're hearing from. Well, um, that's, that's probably a good thing for the guests, so. <laughs> uh, if I receive my absentee ballot in the mail, do I have to vote that way or can I change my mind and, and go to early voting? 
right. Um, that's that's really important. Uh, is you do have three options. Those options are still available to you. Um, if you uh, you know you you don't know what's going to be happening. I always remind people that absentee is an option because you really don't know if it's going to rain election day. Um, now, and you may decide that you're more comfortable once early voting starts in October, and you may decide to go to an early voting site. And we want you to keep that uh, unvoted ballot at home. We don't don't bring it to with you whenever you go vote early voting. Or you can also choose election day to go to your home polling place. And again. Uh, that is an option for the individual out there. So you're not tied to absentee by mail if you request it and you receive the absentee by mail package. Okay, so are there other questions out there, moderators, that we're getting in about how to request an absentee ballot? I think we, we might need to unmute. I did, thank you so much. We have a number of different questions, many of which will be answered later in the presentation. Um, and one of the questions that we have now is following up on the ballot. Is that going to be covered later or can you answer that question? How do we know if we've already sent in an absentee ballot request form, if it's been received and is being processed? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, if you remember last, last year, there were many hearings uh, that came about. Um, as a result of a congressional district race. And uh, that actually uh, created some changes in North Carolina laws. Uh, used to be, you would be able to go online on the state uh, voter search and you would be able to look to see if we had received your request. Um, so now that request status is confidential. Uh, so you will not know, the public will not know who has requested an absentee ballot until um, that individual actually returns it and it shows that it is an approved status for that individual voter. Um, so that is a, a big change that is different from what people are used to. So, but it is, it is uh, a serious one. But if you do have questions, if you do, do want confirmation, you can always call our office. We will ask you certain pieces of information uh, to make sure that we are talking to the actual voter. Um, but we can actually confirm that for you if you contact our office. Great. I think the majority of the questions that have been asked will be covered um, during the course of the presentation, and we will um, make sure that we cover as many as we can. I, I think I saw a question in running down my chat about, could you put two requests in one envelope? The answer is yes. Um, so that is not a problem. That's often done. A husband and wife. Uh, we'll do that or, you know, just it, it can be done or you can have multiple near relatives that can do it. So the answer is yes. Uh, what you want to make sure you're not miscommunicating to people is going out and collecting absentee ballots or absentee request forms and then transmitting multiple absentee request forms on the behalf of the on behalf of the voter. Uh, because remember that the communication or getting that back to us. Uh, needs to be the individual's uh, transmission, or it needs to be the voter or, or the voter's near relative or legal guardian. And so I, I see another question saying, will the signature be required for the online absentee request? I think the question was through the portal. If you did it through the portal, how are you going to get your signature? Do you have to sign it? Um, that right there, you know about as much about that as I do. That that right now, my understanding is still under development with the North Carolina State Board of Elections. Um, my understanding from a very high level without knowing the details, it's gonna be related to the certain pieces of confidential information that's associated with the voter's record that is not privileged to the public, only for election staff. And, and we are gonna talk more about signature matching later. So if I misunderstood the question and you were asking about signature matching, we're going to come back to that. But Dana, are there any more questions about how to request the ins and outs of requesting a ballot? Um, frankly, there are so many questions that I'm not sure. I will <laughs> okay. see them and we will add them next time. All right. Well, let's push on and a topic two, and we'll get to these guys. And if we don't get to them, then we'll do an FAQ. But topic two is filling out the envelope that the ballot goes in. So I assume you all understand you gotta fill out your ballot and then you gotta put your ballot in an envelope to get it back. So we're not gonna talk so much about how you fill out the ballot. I think you guys all you know, are sophisticated and you understand that. 
Um, but let's talk about this container return envelope. And I, um, Gary, I know this is a draft. This has not been the approved final version yet, or is it? Um, it is not done. Okay. Um, so the reason I'm saying that is um, many of you may be aware there's certain bits of litigation uh, that's been going on uh, specifically related to the request process uh, for and, and also the returning process. Um, my understanding is there may be some additional news even coming out about that. So even whenever we were sending you this information, we, we are aware of that uh, pending litigation. Uh, so some of the stuff I may be telling you tonight uh, is kind of wait for it because some of it may change coming up. So that's really important is everything we're talking about uh, right now is based on what we know at this particular moment. Exactly. And so if we could go to the next slide, it has the really important part of the envelope is that backside that has uh, the signatures. I think that's, yeah, this side. Um, so can we talk a little bit about who's got to sign on those X's and what do they have to put on there? Okay. So again, I, I want to reiterate as of this moment. Um, so right now it is the, you'll see they're going to be actually highlighted the critical pieces of information on, on there, uh, which is going to be the key information that our board, our staff are going to be looking for to make sure that they are accurately completed. Uh, the very top yellow square you're going to see on there, that is going to be the voter's signature portion. Okay. Uh, the next part, so that is step two of the process. So uh, one of the, step one, I should say, of the process is gather your witness. Uh, so you'll gather your witness, um, and, and keep in mind your witness can be greater than six feet apart from you because your vote is confidential to you. Um, so once you have your witness to verify that you are the one voting your ballot, then you'll, uh, you'll basically complete your ballot and you can go ahead and put it in the envelope. You will sign on, on step two right there as the voter signature, and then you'll move on to step three. And that is going to be the, uh, the witness portion in the law um, that was handed down or, or some of the changes that came about is the requirements for the witness. So we did at one point have two witness requirements or a notary public. So that's very important to note that is a big change even since the primary. So in this particular case, we have um, only one witness is required and the witness needs to print their name, their address, and then of course the witness signature on there. So those are three components that are required of the witness. So that's very important when you're communicating to other individuals out there or anybody listening, is that the witness, you need those three pieces of information for the witness. Okay, so assuming the voter gets the, the absentee ballot into your office by the deadline, what percent of these ballots do you, does your office reject as not meeting all the requirements? And another way to say that is, what is your rejection rate in recent years? Um, so what we have is I actually pulled up um, and because the law has changed so much over the years, uh, you know, even adding a notary, I tried to get something comparable, but it was, it was even a challenge to try to get it um, because it's, I think it's even going to be a challenge to compare what the current requirements are on there. So I said, well, let's, let me just go back to the primary election. Um, so on there, the, when we get to the point of the board actually denying it, the board is not just arbitrarily. I've heard uh, other people say, well, how many do you throw out? Um, and um, we, you know, that's, it's really a matter of our board, um, our quasi-judicial five-member bipartisan board. It, before a, a absentee ballot is denied, um, it really means that we've exhausted every possible effort to get in touch with that voter. So I, I did a few numbers. Um, so keep in mind a total of 4,563 uh, absentee ballots were received in the primary. And, and of course, that's nothing by scale uh, for what we're going to be seeing this coming November. Right. But, but I was able to run some, some percentages on there. So basically, the number that the board um, denied because they did they were lacking sufficient information that the board was able to approve was 1.64 percent of those and that was mostly because it did not have uh, a proper notarization remember that's no longer going to be even a, an option for people this time 
uh, missing voter signatures, uh, witness information com um, incomplete, um, and a witness sig yeah, or witness signature completely missing. So, um, okay, so, yeah, I was going to ask you the main. What are the reasons? So those are the major reasons that you yeah. would not. Those really, those really are one of the most common ones. Was the voter signature uh, was missing? And one of the things you'll notice um, on the form, I'm really proud of it, the state board of elections uh, listening to uh, county and many other people's feedback is the form is much easier now. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it really is laid out much easier. If you've ever voted absentee by mail before, it was really weighed down with a lot of statutory verbiage, um, not as user friendly. And I think it's much more user friendly at this time. But I want to point out we're not done though with some numbers and statistics. Oh, all right. Sorry. On, on there, there was 0.811% uh, were received back that were returned after deadline, uh, unclear postmarks, which means basically there was no discernible postmark. Uh, and that's going to be important because your, uh, your ballot still needs to be postmarked on or before the deadline 5 p.m on election day and then it still has to be received three days after the election so in other words the board was not able to discern uh the postmark uh for that i remember even at that board meeting our board members using a magnifying glass twisting it turning it holding it up to light everything they could um and basically after the deadline or uh or after the deadline postmark on there so um, 0.88 so less than one percent are returned too late that that's that that's what we have from the last one and um and that very last one though after deadline or postmarks uh the best we can figure on that we there's no way to really discern it would be somebody putting their absentee ballot in and again i'm just using one example if you put your absentee ballot in your in your mailbox at 3 p.m on election day but your mail already ran at 11 a.m you know, the bottom line is it's going to get postmarked the day after. Okay. And have you, have you heard anything from local postal officials about that they're going to postmark everything or that they're promising to deliver every ballot? I hear stuff like this in the media. I don't know if that's true. It's, you know, I'm, that's a big difference, what people hear versus what's really going on. Uh, we have had uh, statewide uh, county office meetings uh, with the, our North Carolina postal representatives. Um, I've, I've got, you know, being just the size of our county, I, I've got a number of individuals we call, we work with. I know that they are definitely working uh, to do everything they can. They, they understand the importance of it. So okay. uh, these are actual people that actually do the work, that are actually working on it. So we, we're really partnering and working with them because they, they recognize the importance of it as, long, as well as we do. Okay, so if you're uh, if you don't have more statistics, or if you do, go ahead. If That's you don't, good. we were going to talk about who can help you uh, complete your ballot if you're okay. sighting impaired or any other reason why you might need help. Okay, uh, so one of the uh, the biggest thing is uh, it's mostly who cannot help you. Okay, so I really want to point that out. Uh, so if you if you do need assistance, there's a portion on the bottom of that request on, on the return on the app that's actually called the application uh, that confuses people because the request form is to request the ballot and then the whenever you return it, that's actually called the application. But anyways, we'll just say whenever you return your ballot, the bottom of that is if you do have somebody to, that is assisting you, uh, please make sure that they are not a a worker, an employee, uh, somebody with an assisted living facility, nursing home, and so forth. That's actually uh, a crime for them to directly assist you with that. Um, other example of who cannot assist you would be a, uh, a candidate um, on the ballot cannot assist you unless they're actually a, a near relative um, of, of you, the individual. So that would be a limitation as far as uh, who cannot do that. Uh, so, so it's really a matter of can you get assistance? Um, you know, there's many reasons you may need assistance. Uh, myself, if you ask me to read something, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to need glasses. And <laughs> you know, so, just using one example, or um, you know, if you maybe have, maybe you just need somebody to read the ballot so they can assist you with marking the ballot. Uh, so there's multiple reasons we can go into uh, where people can assist. But so there is a portion down there 
the very, very bottom uh, under step uh, three of that where an, an individual assisting that voter. Okay, I have one more question and then we're gonna open it up for any questions the audience might have about this um, container return envelope, which I guess you call the application. So let's talk about signature matching. Let, let's say uh, when I got first got married, I always went by my, well, I always put my maiden name in there, Siobhan O'Duffy Millen. But now 30 years have gone by, it's faster, and I just might put Siobhan O. Millen or Siobhan Millen. If I sign it that way, but you have on file my maiden name, what's going to happen? Are you going to throw it out? Yeah, and again, that word throw out, is, uh, <laughs> I think you're using buzzwords on purpose. Um, <laughs> but um, it, it's really a matter of, um, we, we're not here, um, neither is our board, to to kick out ballots. Um, and like I said, if you sat through that meeting, you would have got to watch our board with magnifying glass trying to figure out postmarks. Um, but we, we work on that before we ever get to it. And a lot of times we get, if we do have to contact somebody, they appreciate the fact that we're just double checking to make sure that it is them. Um, we're, and I, I always tell a story, a picture of somebody registering to vote um, in 1968. And just as a frame of reference for that, you would have had to been 21 years old in 1968 to register to vote. Um, so at that particular time, um, a lot has happened to an individual. And, and one of the things that could happen would be the voter's mark, okay? And often if you see a voter's mark on there, uh, you'll often see a voter assistance for that individual uh, that'll be listed for that. But, but yes, names do change. We do look at it. Uh, we're looking more for red flags. Um, you know, my name is Gary Sims, but if you, but if I sign it G Sims, um, you know, you know, obviously if you draw a smiley face, we may uh, get in touch with you, you know, to check, check with you on that. But um, it's more a matter of just make, uh, verifying it is not to throw out, kick out uh, votes. So mostly if we're gonna be contacting those individuals, it's just to double check. Uh, because mistakes can happen. Um, a husband and wife sit down together at a breakfast table and they're gonna vote together for one reason or another. And uh, so whenever they're voting, uh, they get their envelopes mixed up, the wrong one signs an envelope. So we are looking for things like that. So um, yeah, because our, our goal again is to help the voters out and make sure that we can, um, you know, because that's what we, like I said, we always start out with what does the voter wanna do? The voter wants to vote. Okay. Uh, so we try everything we can. So that raises a question. If you see something on the return envelope that is insufficient, do you get in touch with the voter? Yep, and that's another thing. Uh, that's why I think a lot of our numbers are so low. Uh, we're working uh, not to just uh, help people get their vote counted. Uh, we, we're working way before the election to do that. And most of the time, um, on whenever the board is put in a situation to actually deny an absentee ballot that has been returned, it's usually because it's too late. Those are ones that often uh, get here um, on election day, we're not able to get in touch with the voter or maybe even received after election day where there's not much we can do about it. So, um, and often with that, we will try to get in touch with the voter. Let's say that it's the Friday before the election and it's received, it may be impossible for us to get it back to that voter. So we try to get back in touch with the voter, let them know their early voting option and their election day uh, voting options. Okay, so um, I'm gonna throw it open to any other questions about returning your ballot, the envelope, et cetera. Okay, well, I promised that we might go back to topic number one. And uh, we, do, I, we did have a question about whether or not if you're part of a, uh, a non-political, maybe a faith organization, nonprofit organization, can you pick up uh, a bulk number of ballot request forms to share with your membership? Um, what we're doing right now is because it still has to be a voter initiative process. We are providing those to the, uh, the family uh, member. You can come in and you can request it for multiple if you have, uh, you know, you want to get it to your you know, your spouse, your children, your, your parents and so forth. But we'll, we'll provide it to you so that you can make copies. We're encouraging people to go ahead um, and try to uh, make those copies for themselves, which is a little bit different than voter registration forms. Uh, we, we're willing to send you those in the boxes of thousands if we can get those out to you. 
Another question is about, well, actually we had multiple questions about witnesses. Mm -hmm. Can I uh, witness uh, several different um, uh, forms? Can I, can my spouse do it? Um, what are the parameters of who qualifies as a witness? Okay, uh, that, let's go back again to who cannot witness. And that's probably the easiest, best way to kind of put it. And, I've, and I'm glad that came back up actually, because I also uh, forgot to list that you must be 18 years or older to be a witness as well. So that, I'm glad you brought that back up. So it's more a matter of um, who you cannot witness. So it does not limit who can actually, or how many you can witness um, or, you know, other restrictions. So we can't apply restrictions that aren't already defined in the statutes right now. So the answer, the simple answer is, can you be witness multiple? The answer is yes. Um, you know, can it be your spouse? Yes. Um, can it be uh, your neighbor? Yes. So it, again, it cannot, we can't put restrictions on something that's not covered in the law. Okay, another question, and this is like a three word answer. When will we receive our absentee ballots? <laughs> Mailed September 4th. <laughs> Great. Um, uh, a lot of people were interested in the issue around early voting. Can you drop your absentee ballot at an early voting site? Will you have to stand in a long line to do that? Um, what are the parameters of that? Also, if you're if you are not dropping it off in the mail or at the early voting site, where can you drop it off um, where it will be a contactless transaction? Okay. All right. So you're not limiting me on words on that one. So um, no, I'm not. The, I'm not. <laughs> okay. so absentee by mail. Um, you can drop them off at an early voting site to answer that question. Uh, the answer is you really do need to keep in mind, we're working on uh, voter safety and our official safety during this pandemic. Uh, so in, in order to do that, we cannot, we got to make sure we're also maintaining our lines outside because those lines are going to be longer than normal and requiring social distancing. Um, the other big kicker on that is we have to log those in. Um, so that right there, um, even though it is in the law, we're, we're focusing on the other options that voters have. Uh, number one, you can uh, bring them straight to our office. And that's, that's, you know, therefore you're not taking up a voter parking spot at an early voting site. Um, and that's, that right, right there is, um, and if you've been to any of our early voting sites, which I'm sure many of you have, uh, parking is a commodity always at early voting, same as it is election day often at our precincts. Um, the other one is you can bring it to your local post office, um, and that's always a good idea. But if you do that, I always encourage people, whenever you go in, uh, please ask them to put a postmark on that. The same as if you always do your taxes on the tax deadline day, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, you, you may see people there at the post office, but make sure um, you always want to make sure you get that postmark on there. And that, I always look at that as, as the closest guarantee you could possibly get next to actually bringing it directly to the Board of Elections office. Another question for you. I'm going to shoot him until Siobhan tells me not to. Um, given the recent news about possible delays in the mail, uh, people are very concerned about dropping it in the mail. How can you reassure voters uh, that if they put it in the mail, it will be received at the right time, what's that deadline, and how, do you share our concerns about the delivery speed of the absentee ballots? Um, I, I'll just say the post office, uh, I, I'm not their favorite person when I call, um, so uh, <laughs> that's why they are very quick to answer my calls when I do contact them. Um, so it we the post office, I know that they are definitely focusing on doing it. Um, you know, and a lot of people are saying, and even this is the post office is saying it, um, if you're going to be requesting an absentee ballot, and if that is truly your intent to vote absentee by mail this year, is go ahead and request it early um, and try to get it in early. Um, but 
you know, I always want to caution people, and this is especially with so many people interested in elections on, on this call right now. Um, we need to make sure that we're not uh, making people feel not confident in their vote. Um, if you're undecided um, about the candidates that you may be choosing, or maybe you want to do some additional research or hear some additional information, um, I'm hoping this will not drive up people's pressure to make elections voting decisions uh, before they make up their mind. So I'm always on guard for that, make sure we're giving a good message that, you know, don't, don't be so panicked that you're not comfortable with your vote. Because once you mail it in, once it is received, you have voted. Um, so there, you don't get a redo on that. So that's why it's really important. And, and I'll tell you the truth, uh, we saw that in the primary. And that's a perfect example. Uh, many people voted absentee by mail. And then uh, the dynamics of who was running or you know, for uh, certain offices in the primary that changed closer to election day. So I, I really want to remind people of that. So it's, if, if that's kind of a big, big statement, a big deal. Um, but also, um, if, you, if, you, if you are sure who you want to vote for and you feel like your mind's made up, then go ahead and get it taken care of and you'll be able to see it online that we received it and it was accepted. And I just want to jump in there and have people look at the chat. I, I think this judge that ruled today at 4.30, I don't think we can really um, digest what he ruled on this quickly, but he did say something about a chance to fix problems that might keep your ballot from being counted. And it sounds like, to me, that's sort of what you already do, but I'm not going to get into that. But just be aware that this thing might be changing. I heard it was 180 pages and, <laughs> and they're working on a summary of that right now. So, um, so that I think it's going to be take several people a little bit to digest it. So that's, that's why I knew it was something was coming down. Just don't know the details of it because it was literally uh, jumping out, out there and there's no way I could have read that many pages and analyzed it. Here's a real easy question. What if someone forgets to put a stamp on their ballot? What, what happens to that now? Yeah, I, I, the answer is the post office is supposed to deliver it to us, okay? Uh, so that is what we have been told that they will deliver it to us. Um, you know, but again, you're talking about your vote. Uh, so don't just, um, I never like to hear people gambling on, you know, a simple cost of a first class stamp or a forever stamp to gamble on their vote, whether or not it's gonna be received. So always encourage people to use that proper postage. And keep in mind, I did just say, one stamp, uh, which would be a first class stamp or a forever stamp. That's all that's required to mail it back to us. Okay, Dana, I was gonna give it Dana, about and I've got two questions for you. Perfect. One's gonna be a lengthy answer, one's gonna be a short answer. The short answer question is, what method do you use to vote every year? Me personally, typically absentee by mail. Uh, the reasons, because I'm usually working, and um, but I like to sit at home um, I'm probably one of your most informed voters because uh, I know most of all the candidates on all sides. And um, but if I don't know, I actually will Google um, and do some research on myself. Uh, so I, it takes me a long time to vote. So um, so that absentee by mail is my preferred method. And like I said, that's always encouraged my daughters to actually vote absentee by mail. Uh Plug for the League of Women Voters, Wake County. They uh, are part of the 411.org effort, which uh, gets information on all the candidates. So people could go to 411.org or vote 411.org and uh, get information on candidates when they're doing exactly what you do, researching them. Uh, you may have covered part of this, but it's come up a couple of times. So I'm gonna ask it again. What if I make a mistake on my absentee ballot how can I get another ballot to fill out instead? On election day, I can just spoil it, but how does that work for absentee ballots? Yeah, um, the, the easiest and the best way is to get in touch with our office. Um, we could do that uh, once we're able to ver verify certain pieces of information. Um, you could also just write us a letter. Um, it's, it's pretty much a personal uh, conversation. It has happened, it actually happens because sometimes we'll get in ballots where people have spilled their entire morning breakfast on the ballot um, and they choose not to spoil it and send it back to us. Um, and, you know, so they actually send that document and that, you know, that, that's something we have to present to our board. 
Um, and then, uh, but it will be counted as long as it, you know, it's not unreadable. Uh, so, so that's, it's really simple. If you make a mistake, you make an error, uh, if you may have to wait for it, to be, well, not may, you will have to wait for it to be mailed back to you in the mail. Um, but that is an option. And again, remember if, like we discussed before, uh, you may do that and you just basically, you could destroy that and you would then, you also have the early voting option and election day option as well. Okay, let's do one more, Dana. Dana. I've got, one. I've got one more. Thanks, Siobhan. Mm -hmm. So there's still um, um, a lack of understanding fully about the process of dropping absentee ballots at early voting sites. You've told us that we might have to stand in line because they are have to be logged in. Um, how can we make that easier for ourselves? How we can how can we do it most effectively, efficiently? It's, it's the security of the ballots, number one, and it is the logging in that's going to be required. Uh, I've, I've heard uh, pretty much every idea you can imagine, but it also has to be supported by the laws that are out there. Uh, so it's, you know, bottom line is my recommendation, while early voting is covered and it is allowed, um, because of the fact that we have to get it, it has to be received by an official, it has to be secured, and most importantly, it has to be logged in at the site. That's why I always uh, remind people of uh, our office is a good option or um, drop it off at your post office. So um, that's, you know, I, I, I can't ever, I, I'm not gonna say anything that's gonna discourage anybody from turning it at, in at an early voting site, um, but logistically, um, it almost defeats the purpose if you're voting absentee by mail uh, to avoid people by going to an early voting site because there okay. is no, there is no drive by drop off. Okay, I'm going to turn in a second to what happens to my ballot when you guys get it. But I did see a question about nursing homes come through the chat, and I think it's probably worth answering. Now that relatives can't really get into the nursing home to help mom or, or fill it out, uh, who can who can help them? Okay, uh, that was actually due out very recently. Um, the uh, Department of Health and Human Services uh, submitted their recommendation uh, to the governor's office um, the, and the state legislature and the state board of election. And they did that in conjunction working with the state board. Um, so what, what it is, it's called a multi-partisan assistance team. Uh, we're still working on finalizing that plan. The nursing home assisted living facility can get in touch with our office and we will work to get a multi-partisan assistance team. There may even be people on this call right now that may have even worked with us on our multi-partisan assistance team in the past. Uh, so uh, get in touch with our office if you'd like to join that team. Uh, those are bipartisan teams that go out and they can work with those individuals. Uh, we're gonna be working with that facility uh, to see what the best method or mechanism we can to assist those individuals there. Um, it's, that's probably, uh, it, that one hurts my heart a little bit, um, having relatives in nursing homes, assisted living facilities. And, um, you know, and I know that those are truly our most vulnerable population out there and just the limitations out there and constraints. So we, we're hoping to get some good practices in place, but we really will need to be working with the facilities for the safety of those voters when they go in there. Okay. So uh, we were going to talk about the security for the ballots once they're in your warehouse. And uh, what kind of security do you all have? Okay. Uh, so th sometimes there's misinformation or disinformation that goes around about what we have in place. Um, we, we do have, if you've ever been to our office, you'll see it is surrounded by barbed wire and Constantina wire. <laughs> um, we have uh, on-site uh, security and also roving security. 24-7 uh, here. We have uh, basically every secure point is covered by a camera that's also monitored, um, you know, 24-7 by our uh, by our Wake County security. The um, we have a independently everything else. We have a uh, ballot cage. That ballot cage is where we lock up our control items within our warehouse. It has its own uh, independent security uh, alarm zone. It, um, and it's also badge access and restricted only to in individuals. And uh, so it is those, that is probably, not probably, it is our most secure location 
uh, within our office. We're very fortunate to have that location. So, um, you know, custody, control, and security, uh, that is the name of the game. Uh, making sure that we don't have unauthorized access in certain areas. Um, so that's, that's really where, and that was a huge focus. And that really, um, even moving to this location and putting that in, uh, we were very fortunate to work with Wake County to build in some extra security protocols here at our location. Um, and that was also based on um, information that was prov provided by the Department of Homeland Security um, and also taking some of their recommendations for access and control um, of how we're making sure that we're securing those individuals' vote, uh, votes when we do receive them. Okay, so we have a, a common question is how does a voter know if his or her ballot has been received by you? And I think we have some slides that show that voter lookup portal. Yep, that'd be good to show up there. I think it's maybe 10 or 11 um, that would. It's 12. Okay. There you go. So this, right. and we're going to have a link to this. This is on NCSBE. Is that the best place to get it? North Carolina State Board of Elections dot gov and look at voter lookup? Is that correct? Um, the answer, the answer is yes. Um, I, I like to market our website. Our website has it too. Okay. Yeah, our, yeah, ours is also um, our website, Wake County. We actually own the domain name Ready to vote.com r-e-a-d-y-t-o-v-o-t-e.com hmm. um, so we're actually happy with that because it's an easy thing to remember and to pass around to get uh to let people know uh so you can actually access this exact same thing that you're displaying right now uh it, which will link you to the state board and it's it's it just it's a button it just says uh, my voter information Gotcha. And so if we could go to the next slide, that's going to show once you input your data on that slide right here, what is, yeah, this is what you're going to get. Right. This is one of our members. Uh, she blanked out her name. Um, but the at would, so would it come under absentee request down here or would it come under my voter history? Um, it's actually going to show um, under absentee request mm -hmm. uh, once that's actually received. So, um, so once, when, when, when I say receive, when we receive your return absentee ballot. Uh, so once we receive that, you'll be able to see status as okay, and you should be able to do that. And I also want to point out uh, something that we still are waiting for additional information. Part of the statutes, the law changes, um, are also going to require a tracking system uh, where the voter should be able to also look at the various stages their ballot is in individually once it actually hits the mail. So uh, again, we're waiting for more information from the State Board of Elections for that. So this, what we're showing right now could change uh, when we get closer to September, but kind of just give you a little bit of insight on that. So when you say, when it shows up as received, does that mean your staff looked at it and it all looks perfect or does that just mean it came in the door? Yeah, once we actually get it and it's received um, and everything it validates on it, you'll be able to see uh, your status that it was received and everything looks good on it. Okay. Okay. Um, if we could go to the next slide. I had, all right. So what happens, this is a New Yorker cartoon. Uh, what happens if you get absentee ballots that are in a bottle or a, uh, a box, uh, you know, you just get a whole bunch of ballots. What do you do? What's, what's the protocol? Um, are you talking about volume or are you talking No, I'm about talking about they're not in the right envelope. I they're, got not, it. they're not in that container. They're just showed up. Um, those would be actually presented to our board. Um, so we would uh, need to basically make sure that, um, you know, because again, as I mentioned earlier about, uh, some issues that happened that played out in hearings last year is to make sure that we don't have any what the, what's called a, a phrase ballot harvesting uh, type information. Uh, we may need to get in touch with those voters and obtain some additional information for them. Uh, so that's why m making sure the right word goes out um, on how they need to be transmitted back here because obviously if we get uh, a giant package with a bunch of completed, um, unless they are uh, part of a MAP, multi-partisan assistance team, uh, that would be handling it. So 
Um, so in those particular circumstances, we would be immediately getting in touch with those voters and also if we, we would be presenting those to the state, North, uh, to our actual Board of Elections and potentially to the North Carolina State Board of Elections for additional investigation. Okay, so do we have questions from the audience about what happens to the ballots in the warehouse or a anything about when they come into the BOE? Yes, I'm gonna jump back because we, we had a question about the, the, if you wanted to drop it off at the BOE, is that during normal business hours? Can you do it as soon as early voting starts? What are the particulars around that? Um, you can you can do it. If we do have business hours, eight thirty to five fifteen, Monday through Friday, uh, we are going to be looking at additional options that we may have. So we could be making some changes. So the answer as of today is Monday through Friday, eight thirty to five fifteen. Uh, that's the answer today. But you know, we're also we've done additional things in the past, such as maybe have some announced uh, weekend hours, or there may be, and it's really a volume issue. Uh, so it's it's really what can we do to help out as much as we can. And it's like, even during this interview, you, you thank me earlier for taking the time to join in. And I said, well, it's okay. We're already working uh, overtime now, working on stuff. So uh, we told our families goodbye until Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and we are ready, ready to go. <laughs> Any more questions, Can I jump Dana? in with a question, Siobhan? Pardon? May I jump in with a question? Mm -hmm. uh, or are we finished? Have you got another question for me? No, I have time. I was going to let us go till right around 7, if that's okay with Gary, and then we're just going to wrap up. So uh, you can jump in with some more questions. I do want to ask the question about Bladen County at the end. Okay. How are we uh, like them and how are we not like them? Yeah, um, that's too broad. But I mean, what what safeguards have gone into effect that would perhaps make it unlikely we'd be like Bladen? Yeah, um, I I think um, we, you know, in my opinion, uh, some of the things that happened there, uh, we would have caught it earlier. Um, we, you know, only because we're so used to working with large volumes. Um, you know, I always say we're not. Uh, forensic handwriting and analyst here, but we're pretty good at it. Um, we we do pick up on patterns uh, simply by our volume we have here. Um, but but you can't just hang your hat on that. You actually have to have additional checks and balances in place. So um, so we would have noticed uh, some of the things that if people were just basically photocopying request forms, and that was actually some of the things that were done. Uh, but a lot of the laws that went in place uh, since Bladen County were directly in response to that, such as it's illegal for you basically to capture the absentee request um, form information uh, from a voter. Uh, so that's actually one of the things that was put in place uh, because of Bladen uh, County and the things that happened down there. Um, also, that's why you see a lot of the rules and things that are now not only enforced, but they're strictly enforced as far as making sure that we have logs and controls as far as who can do what. So um, that really was uh, some of the bigger items. I didn't follow it totally as close, but I did see the impact of some of the changes that came about in the law as a result of Bladen County. Okay, Dana, do you have more questions? I do, and I apologize for, for jumping in early. I was just very excited, <laughs> and that's a reflection of the folks who are listening, we have lots of questions. Um, can we just start off with talking about uh, when the absentee ballots are actually processed? Mm -hmm. um, we're anticipating a much larger than usual, like 10 times larger uh, number of ballots coming in. When do those get counted and what's the process? Who can witness it? Who's involved? Okay, um, so um, what was really interesting, I was looking at our attendees, he's probably still on here. I actually saw our board chair, uh, Greg Flynn was on this call. Uh, so that being the case, uh, Greg, I hate to break it to you, um, but you, you can actually say goodbye to your family starting September uh, 29th. I actually have a day for that. Uh, so that's whenever our first absentee by mail board meeting will begin. Um, so uh, we're, we're gonna have to make some changes to the way board meetings are done. Uh, those board meetings are gonna be open to the public. 
Um, keep in mind, we will need to be uh, maintaining safety protocols as far as you know, maintaining social distancing and so forth and making sure that we're doing that. But those are still going to be public meetings. Uh, so our board has not picked the exact times, but we're going to have to make adjustments on the way that we have formally done that, uh, manage that, making sure that we're doing it securely as well, just by the sheer volume that we're going to be dealing with. So um, that there's going to be updated information for that. But to quickly answer your question, uh, the, the law changes also were before it was the board would start meeting the third Tuesday before every election. And now that's changed to the fifth Tuesday before every election. So um, that was one of the changes that were made uh, to anticipate an increased uh, volume of absentee that may be coming in. So um, there's more information coming on that. Our board's going to be working on that and they'll develop it. And probably that will start being really developed at one of their very first meetings uh, when that happens. This is a softball that I'm going to toss to you. And that is, do you have enough poll workers? Mm -hmm. um, the answer is we always need more, um, more. And that's why right now um, I, I am a self-professed uh, elections geek. I don't try to hide it. Um, I love talking about elections. That's why I told y'all earlier uh, that you, you need to learn when to shut me down on some questions. But <laughs> the answer is uh, we always need poll workers. Um, we, we know that we have already lost a significant number of our experienced officials out of all due respect for them. Um, you know, some of them are part of a vulnerable population. Um, they've let us know that they want to come back next year. So we are, um, they're part of our family. Um, but we, we need to expand our family this year. So if you know people that are interested, get in touch with us. Um, you can also click on the get involved uh, button on readytovote.com and you can actually go there. Um, Click on that Get Involved. You can also sign up to be a multi-partisan assistance team member. Um, also, if you're interested, early voting. Uh, don't forget, we got 17 glorious days of early voting. It's a lot of early voting. So it takes a lot of people also to make that successful. So there's a lot of opportunities out there for individuals to get involved. I had a really quick question. Go ahead. I'm not sure who that is. Who is that? Please identify yourself. Sorry, I'm sorry, okay. it's uh, Juliana Dolzen. Um, I wanted to find out why can't the public go into the Board of Elections on election night to observe? Other um, North Carolina counties allow it, other, um, even other states allow it. The Wake County Board of Elections warehouse is huge, so space really isn't a limiting factor. Yeah, but I wanna go back to the first part is um, uh, security is a huge part. I mean, that's, but, that's, that's the answer right there. and. And if, if we're not having a public board meeting, like I said before, uh, we need to make sure that we're maintaining security. But I mean, we can't go in and watch the ballots being counted at the end. Oh, the ballots aren't counted at the end. They or, you know, basically um, follow the chain of command and actually watch the ballots wherever they go. Yeah, that, insert. right. That happens on election day at the polling place. Right, but we're, um, we're denied access to going in and observing why is that once the polls close at our 206 polling places and the last voter departs um any observer can go into any election day polling place and observe that process and that's mm. not true that's yeah. not true uh it's supposed to be true i'm a poll worker and we post those tabulations on the door so if there are individual precincts that are not doing that um Tisk tisk, they're not reading the manual. Um, Good question, Gary. Well, actually, Gary. To, to be quite honest, Gary, you're the one that turned us down. I, you know what, Juliana? It sounds like you have some greater issues than are going to be resolved on this. No, they're, they're public day. issues that the public so needs to know about and start they questioning need to know about why it. they're not they being done the like they're supposed to. Call. That's not the purpose of our event. So we're thrilled that you're into it, that you want to protect everybody's privacy and make sure that it's a transparent process. We want to go on to another person, another question, okay. another interest. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dana, did you have any other questions about, I, I, th I think one of the questions that needs um, to be, that we haven't really honed in on, on the absentee ballot is, when are they actually 
put in the tabulator. I, we talked about the meetings and that Gary and uh, y'all are going to start meeting in late September to go over the envelopes and, uh, and see who's complied and which one should go in the good pile and which one in the maybe pile. But when do they get tabulated? Um, that actually, okay, so the actual, the board does have in the discretion, that's part of the reason they did expand that to five, uh, five weeks. Right. Um, they have the option of actually going ahead and beginning the stages of feeding them into our high-speed counters at that uh -huh. time. Um, but they also, um, they can also do it no matter what, not they can, but no matter what, we will not know the results of that. Um, until election day. So those results will not be done. And historically, that would be, you, that's one of the first things you see at 7.30 p.m. on election day. Um, those results, it's just really based on volume um, that's going to be coming in. And that's where we've been talking to many people um, about the expectations that the media and the public may have now of these quick returns, not just for North Carolina, not just for Wake County, is it's gonna be a little bit later night, maybe a later morning um, in some cases before you start seeing some numbers that are gonna be coming in, uh, depending on volume. So that's why we're really encouraging people, um, you know, if you know already your decision on who you wanna vote absentee by mail, go ahead and get it taken care of, get it back to us. Um, but no matter what, those results will not be known until election night. So you guys don't run a private results tape and uh, any point? that that would that would send us to jail and no okay. that's okay. not, not the case okay anything else dana or not at this time i was just going to remind everybody that gary and his staff have very generously offered to uh, look through the chat and see uh, and address any questions that have been unanswered uh, during the course of this what seemed like a very short amount of time uh, for the event but he will be processing that information and um, so you can look forward to hearing more about the particular questions that you asked. So thank you everybody for your involvement. Yeah, I want to thank everyone for asking such thoughtful questions and I want to thank Gary for giving us a chunk of your evening. Uh, Gary, do you have any last words that you want to sum up? No, I, I think there's a lot of good questions. I hope we can capture some of those questions. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, it's, it's really about what can we do to help the voter. Um, and so if there are questions out there, you can always feel free to uh, try to get back in touch with us and we're gonna do everything we can because, um, and also make sure that you are properly communicating the right information um, out there. So I think, I hope, hope a lot of people did learn a few things if you didn't know already so that we can uh, uh, work with you to help get that right information out there to everybody. Right, and I just want folks to make a plan uh, to vote. I hope this has started you thinking about your, what you're going to do this fall. You can talk to five people over the next few weeks about how you plan to vote. You can order your absentee ballot. You can talk to your college-age offspring about how they're going to vote. Uh, and you can have a Zoom call where you explain um, absentee voting to any of your friends. So thank you, Gary, and uh, thank you to everyone who took part, to the Politicas, Politica NC is always looking for new members, and um, our last slide is going to be some references that uh, you can go to for more information. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Gary. Um. Dana or Susan, can we make sure we can't we um, print out that chat? Yeah, I'm saving it so we'll have a copy of that. Perfect. An email account of that. It might um, be good to send that over to BOE just so they have something yep. to refer to. Will do. Yeah. I'll share that with uh, all the folks who are concerned. Yeah, should have had those links ready to put in the chat so people could grab them. But no, that's okay. It's okay. I said we'd leave the chat open for a few minutes so people okay. can copy those down if they wanted to. Um, are, are all the guests?